Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Who Knew? You're in for a real treat today as resident Susan Albert interviews resident Richard Morrow. Dr. Morrow will be sharing a lot with us, including growing up in Massachusetts, his academic work at Yale, Brown, and Duke, his three college presidencies, yes, that's three, his four books, and his great love of France. We are airing today's program live on TV 970, but we also have a live audience, hooray! <laughs> so, after the interview, we'll be glad to take questions from anyone in our audience this afternoon. So, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan to, so she can start the interview. I'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Morrill this afternoon. I appreciate all the time and energy he's invested in this program. It's, he's very, been very cooperative, very energetic about it. He has lived here with Martha for three years. He is the chancellor of, at the University of Richmond and has been that since 1999. He's written four books and is working on another entitled Belief in a Secular Age. He's been on four corporate boards, two of which were industrial and two financial. He has four or five honorary degrees. He was honored in France as a member of the Order of National Merit also honored with membership in the academic palms. But he began his, his story in Hingham, Massachusetts. Rich, can you tell us about Hingham? Thank you, Susan, and thank you all for coming and hearing um, a story in the making. Uh, we moved to Hingham, I think, when I was five or six. My dad had been a chauffeur and then a postman. And at the end of World War II, the veterans returned to take the position that he had held. And so he started then his work as a clerk in a hardware store right in the middle of the town of Hingham. He had not had a lot of education, typical of that period, I think, for someone born early in the last century. And so we were fortunate to be in a very nice town, but there was always a sense of being right on the edge in terms of finances because, of course, my mother, even though uh, she had two children, was very busy with other projects, very involved in the church. But women in that period, this is now the early 50s, really didn't work much outside of the home. And so there was a tight financial circumstance, which my mother worried about a lot more than my father. And that's an early memory that uh, is, has stayed with me. At the same time, there was a lot of opportunity in growing up in Hingham. Hingham is a colonial town that was settled in 1635 by Puritans from Hingham, England. And so there was a sense of history and significance to life in that town. It's right on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean in the greater Boston Bay, 19 miles from the city of Boston. It had a population of people that were reasonably diverse. There were different ethnic groups. There was, there was one, there were one or two black families in town. Uh, and it was a relatively prosperous town. And you could drive on the main street in Hingham, called Main Street and see a lot of lovely ancient homes going back into the 1700s. There was also a sense of the importance of education. And so in this historic town, there, was, uh, there were selectmen and there was an annual town meeting. 
and there was a good school system. And so as I went to the Hingham High School uh, and to elementary schools before that, there was always a feeling that education mattered. Uh, my dad hadn't finished high school, and so I ended up, um, I think as I was, the first person in my family to go to college. And that happened in part because that was the spirit and, and timber of growing up in Hingham. But it was also an interesting part of my life that when I was a, a young boy, there was a neighboring golf club called Cohasset Golf Club. It was the neighboring town, and I could walk there in 20 minutes, walking through the woods and around the paths and get there easily. And at age 11, I started to caddy. And so I carried a lot of golf bags. Uh, there were no carts in those days. I mean, there were no carts you could get in and drive. You might pull a cart. But that became, for me, uh, a very important source of opportunity because there I met a wide range of people who were typically pretty successful in their lines of work. And I became a caddy for one family in particular. And they would pick me up, the, there was a, a woman golfer who would pick me up after school and drive me in her Cadillac to the golf club <laughs> and then drive me home afterwards. And then I would meet people that took an interest in me, and it's sort of the American story where if you're fairly conscientious and seem to have a little ambition, people rally to you a bit. And so there was a professor from Harvard University who would come by and say a few words in French to me, and I would surprise him because I could speak a little French. I was studying French in high school, and I loved French to death because of this extraordinary teacher that both Martha and I had in high school. And she was beyond inspiring. So as time went on, the members of the golf club did take an interest in me. And one man in particular said, well, now, Rich, where are you going to go to college? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't have a lot of money to go to college. And I said, I don't know. Maybe I can get into UMass and go there. And he said, well, listen, um, why don't you come with me and take a look at Brown? And I said, well, okay, I can do that, but I don't know how I'd pay for it. He said, just, just, let's just look. So by that time, I was getting interested in, in colleges and focusing on what would be a good choice. And I had a couple of other applications in. But he drove me down, and, and after that, a couple of months later, um, I'd had, I had reasonably good grades in high school and pretty good test scores, and so, I guess I was admissible. But he got a letter from the Brown admissions office that I can remember to this day, and he sent it along to me. And it said, his name was Russ, Russell. Dear Russ, uh, we've reviewed the papers, we've met the boy, and you can be assured he's gonna be accepted and he's gonna get a full tuition scholarship. So don't write any more letters for his file. You've sent in <laughs> enough. So I brought that letter home. <laughs> shared it with my parents, and in an evening I, I, I've never forgotten, my mother, who was a lovely, caring, um, deeply Christian woman, uh, very empathetic, very affectionate, she saw this letter and read it and said, you're going to go to an Ivy League school? And she said, this has never happened in our family. We're just little people. We're little people. And I said, well, I'm going to go. And she said, well, we can't help you much. And I said, and they sold an insurance policy and gave me $100. So I went off to Brown, and that really was an opportunity that opened then lots of doors. I guess the, the thing I remember about the Brown experience is that during my second year, the first year was fine, but I was sort of going through the motions. I was conscientious. I did my work. Um, by the second semester, I started getting really good grades. By the second year, 
I fell in with a group of students who were interested in ideas and they were all thinking about going to graduate school. And so I began to wonder. My plan was really I wanted to teach high school history because I was pretty good in history and I thought that would be a good walk, talk, a good place for me to walk. And then uh, the more I took these courses, I saw the ideas connecting. Uh, I began to wonder, maybe I could actually go on and go to graduate school. And that's when I fell in love with ideas. And for me then, and for the rest of my life, the fascination has been with the way ideas develop and interact and how a certain historical pattern leads to another. And I began to see the power of learning. And as I've gone on in, as a professor and as a college president, not much really has changed in my sense of the transforming power of education. So I am a very strong idealist about education. And I see it as in effect, developing the powers of mind. There's a quote I like, we are born into the world, but we're educated into the possession of our human powers. It's not all in formal education. It's what you learn at mother's knee as well. It's what you learn in interactions with others all around you. But the basic thought is the powers of the mind have to do with uh, critical thinking and analysis uh, uh, and, if you will, creativity and imagination and effective communication. And those are the powers that uh, are intrinsic to the human process. And that's what became my life purpose. Now, it also happens that as I went along in my studies, uh, I became very interested in history and religious thought and in French. And so, that, those became the structure for a lot then of my subsequent education. It happened that um, my sophomore year at Brown, I got a note from a professor in an introductory religion course, and he sent me a note and said, I just read your exam, a really good exam, why don't you come by and talk about, uh, talk about it. To get that kind of recognition in college is like somebody just touching you on the head and blessing you. It's a very powerful motivator. I was also, though, uh, I knew, interested in ways that make no sense whatsoever in going to France. Now, why would a, someone who had no financial capability whatsoever want to go study in France for a year? It was not what I was majoring in. I had taken some courses at Brown in French and I said, I want to go to the best French program that exists. And so I applied to Sweetbriar. Sweetbriar College had the best junior year abroad program in the country. I was lucky enough to get in. And so uh, I couldn't take my scholarship from Brown. I was, a little, uh, I was a little offended at first. Why can't I take my scholarship? Because you're not going to Brown. So I said, okay. So Sweetbriar gave me passage over and back, and that took care of a big expense. And then the summer before I went, I worked 60 hours a week at the golf club. By now I was, uh, I guess I was, had been caddy master, but then I shifted over to become a clubhouse boy, and I was doing everything under the sun. I was even short order cooking, which is a little <laughs> odd. I, I don't tell Martha about that too often. Um, <laughs> But in any case, there I was, saving up my money. I succeeded. And one of the greatest things that's happened, that family for whom I had been caddying in the earlier years, they came forward and gave me checks that totaled $500 to go to France. There was a French woman in the golf club. She was a war bride. She raised money from the members of the club, and they gave me another $400. One of the deans at Brown... Uh, who was in my fraternity, or had been, and, and used to come by the fraternity house, came by one day and gave me a check for another $500. So when I got to Paris, 
I had a lot of money in my pocket. I went to the Morgan Guarantee Bank and I opened an account with whatever I had and I would go there once a week. It's in the Place Vendôme. And go to this little French man uh, who looked the part and I would take out my 50 francs for the next week. So that whole French experience was a huge opportunity to be apart from your culture, your place in the world and think about who you were and what you wanted to be. It was also a time for me to develop fluency in French, a love of French culture and history and art. On the way in from the Mauritania dropping us in Le Havre, we got on a bus and we drove to Paris, stopping at two places. Once for lunch in a Norman, an inn in Normandy, which was enchanting. And the next thing I knew, we were at Chartres Cathedral. And so for a 20-year-old who had never been out of New England until that moment, to walk into Chartres Cathedral was like a stunning moment of both spiritual and intellectual development. To walk the aisles of Chartres and to see the stained glass windows, you felt a sense of God's presence that you rarely can do in a humdrum world. And uh, I remember the short hair on my neck was rising as I was walking down the hallways of Chartres. And so that whole year in France I studied uh, at one of the fine institutions for the most part. Uh, most of my studies were at the Institut d'études politiques, the Sciences Po, the Institute of Political Studies. I took a course at the Louvre Museum where we walked the halls of the Louvre every Friday for three hours. Then I took, uh, we often would go to the Jeux de Paume, which is the collection of the Impressionists. And it was an unforgettable opportunity. And I never would have done that if I had stayed at Brown. So that lifelong interest then translated into an awareness that I, I really did want to go on for further study. In my senior year, I took an uh, interdependent study with a, f a religion professor named Wendell Dietrich. And I studied Karl Barth and Reinhold Niebuhr uh, in a comparison of their, their theories of, uh, well, it's called, you know, the, it's called anthropology in, in theology. I did an anthropological study, the, the, the doctrine of man. Uh, and so the professor wrote me a note. I still have the note. I still have the paper. It's in my office at Richmond. And it said, just as I suspected, you can think theologically with some power. So I had to go to divinity school to check that out. So I was awarded a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship to go to Yale Divinity School. Uh, not, not that I wanted to be a pastor. I knew I wanted to be a professor. But the way in which you became a professor was to do three years of a, in a, in a, typically in a university-oriented seminary. So that uh, launched me in that direction very strongly. And at the end of my third year, Martha and I were married on the Yale campus in, in Dwight Memorial Chapel. And what the next step was, was a decision to go on to get the PhD. And to do that, um, I had applied to several institutions. I was accepted at Harvard. I was accepted at Duke. And Duke offered a far superior scholarship. It was the biggest scholarship they gave. So we said, you know, we're going to go to Duke. So there was our journey to the south, where we had three uh, very strong, excellent years. The French picture came back again because at the end of uh, our second year and third year, no, first and second years at Duke, my wife was always wanting to go back to France. She had studied there her junior year, and so she was looking at a... Saturday uh, Review of Literature magazine. And so she found this little ad that said, we need guides to take T 
teenage students to France. We signed up, we went to New York, we got the job, and we both looked at each other and said, they're gonna pay us to go to <laughs> France? So we did for two summers. And the end of the second summer, uh, as I was planning now to write my dissertation, I had decided I wanted to write it comparing the thought of H. Richard Niebuhr, who had been a professor of mine for one half a semester at Yale, uh, comparing it with a theologian, a French theologian, by the name of Roger Mel. He was in the uh, Église Réformée de France. He was in the French Reformed Church. And he was in Strasbourg. So I put Martha on a plane back home, and I stayed in Strasbourg for three weeks and had three or four interviews with him asking him about his book uh, that he had written that I was focused on. It was uh, called On the Authority of Values, De l'Autorité de Valeur. And it's been a lifetime concern of mine to, to understand and think about ethics and values in a variety of contexts. And it got me into a lot of French thinking and phenomenology that I have uh, continued to be interested in. So at that point, um, it was time to find work. And I had my first appointment uh, as a professor of religion at Wells College in New York. And a friend of mine who had been in graduate school with me called and said, Rich, they're starting, they want to start a religion program here at Chatham College in Pittsburgh. Are you interested? And I said, I've only gotten, just got to, to Wells. He said, well, you ought to interview. So I did, and I got that position. And so I taught religion then for the next uh, four years, full time. And then the president of the institution, with whom I had actually had a fairly difficult relationship, because I was a young Turk faculty member. <laughs> uh, it was the late 60s. And uh, I was backing somebody for tenure that didn't get tenure, and I was a little bit cranky about it. And the, f the president didn't appreciate me much. Um, in any event, things changed, things happened. He asked me after a couple of years to become assistant to the president, and I accepted. And so at the age of 35, I started much more time on administration. I taught part-time. But I found I really liked it. I couldn't tell that to some of my, my colleagues because they thought I had gone over to the, to the, to the dark side becoming an administrator. <laughs> I know, Jim, but you understand. <laughs> so in any case, um, that, that president, uh, Edward Eddy, then became the vice well, became essentially the second in command for the whole Pennsylvania State University. And he asked me to go with him and to become the chief of staff for the provost, which I did. But in my second or third year there, um, Salem College was looking for a president. And because I had had most of my experience in colleges for women, I had taught at Wells, at Women's College. I taught at Chatham for uh, seven or eight years, a women's college. Uh, and so I knew the issues very well, and I was a great enthusiast for women's education. So I was offered the presidency of Salem. And at the end of my second year, the beginning, my third, um, which is the hardest decision I've ever made, a, a headhunter came along and tried to interest me in Center College. And I said, don't bother, I'm not going anywhere. Um, and a friend of mine from graduate school was at Center and he had put my name in. And I said, Eric, there's no way I'm gonna leave Salem. I love it here and it's, it's wonderful. So. Well, they didn't succeed in their search at center, so the, this executive recruiter came back again and again. And finally he said, you know, you're not really, you're being really stubborn. Uh, the chairman of the board happens to be the chairman of the Union Pacific Corporation, and 
the least you can do is, is give us some idea about how we're not doing the right thing to attract a person to this presidency. You're a new president, you should understand what we're doing and not doing. And you've got to meet this man. So I met the man and he, he was a phenomenal, charismatic man. And so I said, okay, I'll talk to you about what you're not doing or doing. So Martha and I drove from North Carolina to Kentucky and listened to their story. And of course, they wanted me then to come and take the position. And so finally I said, well, I'll do it if I have, but I have to stay through this coming year. And they said, no, we can't have you stay through the next year. And I said, I'm sorry, then it won't work. So they, they worked out a part-time president or short-term president. So we went to, to uh, center. And so that was the second of, of the presidencies. And it was something, I, I had a really good staff at center. It was a very ambitious college. I had a terrific board chair who was this leader in American business. And I began to, to develop a lot of ways of thinking about leadership that then became an important part of that profes professional responsibility and identity. I, I got on to a motif of, uh, I guess you'd call it strategic thinking. And I began to develop a narrative theory of leadership. That is to say, I became convinced that if you could just understand the story of a place, if you could really get the sense of its legacy and its, what you could call its saga or its story, what set it apart, what made it tick, why did people care about it, why did people give money to it, what was the experience people had, uh, did, it, did it transform their possibilities in life, and how and why. Um, those became the ways in which I began to think about the leadership of, of a college. And it worked, it worked pretty well. Uh, we got a lot of attention for the strategy work we were doing. And then in, in that particular context, something really special happened. At the end of my second year, this really exceptional vice president came to my office and said, Rich, we've done it. I said, what have we done? We have the highest percentage of alumni giving of any college that I have been able to trace. I just got off the phone with, with Dartmouth. They had 67% alumni giving that this year. I, I called Williams, because they're always high, and Williams had whatever, 68%. We just came in at 69.7%. <laughs> I said, uh, are the numbers good? I mean, how do you, how do you uh, know that they're accurate? He said, ours I know are accurate because we count as an alumnus everybody who went here for one semester. And do we solicit all of them? Is it a solicitation of everyone who has been here or just the people who gave last year? And he said, it's clean. It's everyone who has been here. I said, wow. So we got all kinds of stories, Wall Street Journal and elsewhere, that toted that motif of superb alumni giving. So that became something of the story, the saga, of this little college in Kentucky that had had the highest rate of alumni giving. It led to a major grant from a New York foundation which allowed us to build a new science building. And so it was uh, sort of definitive of that, of that period and that moment. And then once again, the University of Richmond appeared. I had been contacted at the end of my fourth year at Center and they were searching for Bruce Heilman's successor. And so I said, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not looking, I'm not talking anymore, uh, I can't do it. We just started a campaign and we have to be successful in a campaign. So thank you, but no thanks. They hired somebody else at Richmond I was getting a bit itchy to get back closer to the East Coast where we had family and Kentucky's a long way from, 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 uh, from Hingham. Uh, Richmond's a little closer and easier to get to, to, the, to our family. So in any case, I said, can't do it. The president who was hired had health problems. He'd left after nine months. Bruce came back into office 
they started the search again and they called me again and I said okay this time I think I can in conscience take a look so it all worked out and so we came in 1988 and we had uh, a very a very good situation at Richmond we had superb funding we had terrific support from obviously the some of the major donations ever made in American education through the Robbins family we had a very good faculty and staff we had devoted uh, people to the institution it's a very high order positive uh, productive uh, institution and an opportunity to be ambitious about its future so that same method of strategic thinking that uh, seemed to have worked well starting a little bit at Salem and then at, at Center became an opportunity to make that one of the central ways in which we would we would think about leadership and what was the hardest part of being the president of U of R well the hardest part for any presidential uh, service in higher education really relates to a lot of things but one of the factors is that as the chief executive officer of an institution of learning you you really have to work collaboratively and collegially with a wide variety of other members of the organization uh, unlike uh, corporations there is not a top-down authority system there isn't a limited way I mean as the head of a college or university you do have a staff of people who are in a fairly typical relationship of hierarchical authority but that's not the case with regard to the alumni of the organization it's not the case with regard to the relationship that you may have with external sponsors uh, it may be that for a lot of private institutions there's a church relationship that figures in prominently at Richmond the relationships with the Baptist was not a difficult circumstance although it still had its measure of uh, attention that it required so you have as well the critical decision-making process that the faculty plays in the institution as a president you don't hire the faculty that is a job for faculty peers to do and so if it's the chemistry department who's doing the hiring for the vacancy you may work hard on making sure there's a fair process in place that there's not going to be discrimination that you're going to seek the best uh, process for interviewing but the person who's hired in the chemistry department <clears throat> at a place like the University of Richmond you'll never meet until they come and so there is substantial shared decision making particularly in the sphere of faculty hiring promotion and tenure and certainly with regard to the curriculum and how it's taught and what is taught and so the, the authority is very diffuse and very decentralized and so what often happens as a college president is that you have to find ways in which to use the influence that you have for the good of the whole and what I found was that a strategy process for me was a way in which to make sense out of the decision-making process uh, having the opportunity for different participants to put their oar in the water on the strategy question to have sessions where you listen to what people have to say and where you then try to, to synthesize out of the different voices that are being heard what are the, the narratives that really define the consciousness of the place and that give you a sense of forward momentum and while you're doing that you've got to be able to continue the relationships with a variety of other constituencies you've got to be able to have strong relationships obviously with the key alumni leaders clearly with the board of trustees which is the ultimate authority uh, in the institution but clearly also with uh, you know former students and and townspeople and government 
So you spend some of your time in Washington, D.C. and in the capital of, the, of, of, of Richmond when there's a critical higher education issue. There is funding that comes to private colleges from the state of Virginia, um, not to the institution, but to the parents of students. There's a thing called the tuition assistance grant. So every Virginia resident who has a child in a Virginia college gets a, whatever it is now, probably $1,800, $2,000. Um, when I was in office, it was probably around 800 or 1,200. And, and we work that relationship because it's a very important way in which to, uh, in effect, say that the, su the subsidies that go to students in public institutions, something uh, much less than that, but something in, in some ways uh, on a parallel basis ought to come to students in a private institution. So y you work in a variety of different relationships. And so the, the, some of the best, the, the best study uh, on the college presidency was done, what, 30, 40 years ago by two scholars at, uh, at I think, at Berkeley and Stanford. Um, it was called um, Leadership and Ambiguity, the American College Presidency. And it was uh, headlined in a lot of the, of the work of the book, um, What Is It Like to Lead an Organized Anarchy? So that dimension of having fluid patterns of relationship is the most demanding part of the job. I must say, during the 1990s at Richmond, um, it was, I must say, compared to what I see nowadays, a much easier job than the tensions that now hit our country. To, to try to lead an academic institution in a period of political polarization is no fun. And so there is just so many areas that you can see now where conflict is arising in very intense ways. Um, I grew up, a, I mean, I grew up in, in terms of my academic career in the late 60s. Uh, and I saw polarization. Uh, it's, a, it's a little like that. There is now the same kind of gap between the generations. And so, it's a different time, and it's a good time to uh, have completed your service as a president. Um, so let's see now, what other things might be of interest? Well, what are you most proud during your tenure at U of R? Well, I, I'm proud that we did have a good, I think, a good decision-making process. I'm, I'm proud that we started also addressing the fact that um, the institution, uh, as a function of its culture and society, had been a segregated institution until 1967. And that we put in place a number of initiatives that would try to open the door, we hoped, ever more widely, to so students from, from different backgrounds. We're in a, in a city that's essentially a majority African-American city and until 1967, you could come to the University of Richmond if you were an African American. Uh, there was a strong, as you know well, there was just a strong moment in history there that made it extremely difficult. So we put in place some scholarships that were related to finding talented African American students from Richmond to come to the University of Richmond. And that has now continued there was a time when we defined a scholarship program for African-American students from Richmond. And someone from the Department of Education in Washington said, well, you know, that may be something you can't do anymore because you can't give scholarships based on race. And I said, well, when that's final, let me know and we'll comply. But until that's final, please understand, we are an institution that excluded African-American students. And therefore, we are in a period of catch-up. So we have to do this now in order to establish the clear message that this institution is open for business for everyone. And I think now, in fact, you, you couldn't do it that way. 
because it would be seen as strictly, you know, defined by race, which would be a violation. But at the time, we, we had to make strides. So we, we had a, when I came in 1988, we had a 3% African-American population in the institution. I think 10 years later, we had 6 or 7%. Um, we had 1% international students at Richmond in 1988, and I think uh, it got much higher than that because one of the things that we did was establish a lot of exchange programs with institutions all over the world. Uh, and now the institution has a very strong, uh, diverse population, and its standards and expectations are extremely high. Um, its SAT scores are not any longer uh, seen as a, uh, a really strong measure because they really don't predict. They predict how a, how a first year student typically might do, but they don't predict well for what happens after the first year. And so a lot of students who are very talented in a given field that doesn't get, doesn't get measured by a standardized test end up finding their love of study and then by their junior and senior year, they're shooting the lights out academically even though their scores weren't that great. Um, and so now, though, on the scores, when I came to Richmond, I don't know what the exact numbers were, but they were, I don't know what the average SATs were, maybe 1,200 or 1,880, 1,180 or something like that. Now they're 1,400. And so it's an extremely selective institution, and its resources have continued to grow substantially so that the endowment of the university now... Um, represents there's one million dollars of endowment for every undergraduate student. So that is uh, probably among the top 20 in the country on a per capita basis. So that's how you give scholarships. Uh, a very high percentage of our students receive scholarships in which they um, simply analyze what the family can provide and then the university steps in with its awards, uh, expects a small, uh, expects uh, the student will have a, a job either at ca on campus or in the summer, and then there's a small loan, but it's not a very large loan. I think the large, the, the loans don't go above $5,000 per year. So it might be you graduate with $20,000 in debt, but you don't have to take it if you can find other funds from a from a long lost uncle, then that's fine. Um, but the University of Richmond uh, is thriving. We could go on for a long time, but I think um, probably we should go to questions now from the audience. Okay, we'll be right with you, Ms. Maxwell. <laughs> There's a mic that's coming around. Hi, I'm so glad you explained um, that the president of a university doesn't have full control over, you know, the faculty in different departments. Because the question I was going to ask you of what is now called a cancel culture yeah. of the, so for instance, the first one I can remember was when Condoleezza Rice was canceled from after she'd been invited to speak at the Brandeis graduation. Well, that might have been a decision of the president who had the right to choose a graduation speaker. But if she'd been invited by the International Relations Club, it would have been that person who, that group that invited her and therefore would cancel the person. But my question is is really about the main question of um, not hearing an alternate point of view from what the university's point of view might be. Everyone has, a, has different ways of dealing with that. Some places have built systems into the process to protect against that kind of event happening. What you risk at one level is... Um, that a lot of people can vote with their feet, and so you do risk having you know, people not come to graduation, or you have risk all kinds of negative things that would be embarrassing for the, 
the speaker because as I say, it's a different world now. It's a different generation. It's a different mix of people and desires. And so uh, there are ways to, to try to attend to those kinds of conflicts. It happens that uh, one of my successors who is now my office partner, uh, Ron Crutcher, the university's first African-American president, has had a pretty strong line about the defense of academic freedom. And in his, his autobiography, he's made a very clear case about how he would handle the concerns that a given speaker who might come to the campus, assuming as, you know, is, is broadly a, a strong academic representative, not somebody who's there, you know, as a kind of plant of some kind, he, he has said, you know, if there is going to be that kind of person who creates offense in the minds of some, then I regret that, but we will assure that when this individual speaks with a certain point of view, then somebody with a contrary point of view will also have the opportunity to speak. And then he says in writing, and if in some individuals find that to be very offensive, I regret that, but we're going to go forward with honoring the opportunity for different points of view to be heard. And I think there was a case in our law school where that played out and he simply said, we're going to regret you if you feel offended, but this person has, you know, a clear academic perspective. It's backed up by publications and research and we will have a different point of view available in response. Uh, so s things like that, I think, can produce, um, uh, you know, a strong claim on the traditions of academic freedom, which, uh, you know, I think in most cases are, are still in most campuses finding a way to, to honor that, that critical uh, affirmation of academic freedom. And sometimes you have to get on top of it early, clarify the, pre, the protocols and procedures, uh, and obviously make sure that if there is like threats of gunfire or warfare or something that can happen, you know, you may have to postpone it because you, you're not going to have, you know, bloodshed over, over that kind of issue. But some places, when all this started four or five years ago, probably weren't, weren't prepared to deal with the protocols that need to be in place to assure uh, that it's an open, uh, open campus. There's a, go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what, one, one question, listening to you in, in my mind now, in, in terms of your interest in history and stuff, is um, the, the historical roots of the University of Richmond are with the, with the Baptist uh, Convention, you know, aren't they? It was to train clergy and stuff like that. So I'm curious about how the relationship with, with the church or that, that initial emphasis on spiritual training and, and uh, developing church leaders, uh, you know, has changed. I mean, how that happens, uh, how important the roots are, I mean, in terms of uh, the university? When I, when I came, um, I was, in general terms, happy to have a church relationship. I'd been president of two church-related colleges previously. Um, I take theological thinking seriously. Uh, it's what I like to do and what I was trained to do. So I, and I saw it as a valuable relationship in, with regard to the mission of the institution, particularly in terms of the larger aims of education. That it's a question of, as I often like to say, uh, not just having, um, if you will, disciplinary specialty as your form of knowledge, which is important and valuable, but it's also a college education ought to be a place where you learn to question what you want and to ask yourself, are the things that I want worth wanting? So as I think about my future, as I think about 
the democratic responsibilities, what is worth wanting? And that emphasis I saw as coming out of a church relationship. And so during my period, uh, we had a relationship in which we used the funds that came from the General Association, uh, the Baptist General Association of Virginia, to support the uh, Baptist students from Baptist congregations in Virginia to get scholarships at the University of Richmond. And there was a little friction from time to time, but again, uh, uh, I thought the relationship was, uh, was valuable, as, certainly as legacy in terms also of service. We've had a strong emphasis on service at the University of Richmond so that we've enabled students to be involved in lots of different service opportunities around Richmond. I was very proud that when I was in office, we got a $7 million grant to help students who wanted to do service in Richmond to be able to do that and therefore not take a campus job to replace that with service. They weren't, they weren't compensated, but they could, meant that they didn't have to take as much loan. So there was, a, there was an incentive for them to do their volunteering. But in any case, what happened after I left office was that it became increasingly the case that both by law and by um, changing custom, the idea of um, of several things, but one of them was uh, benefits for uh, same-sex couples. That became an issue in the legislature. And at first, there was going to be a restriction of state support for any institution that provided benefits for same-sex couples. And things began to get tense around that issue because universities were prone to provide benefits and the state was not, at that point, willing to make that possible. That changed in this level of the state. The state no longer was interested in some, somehow prohibiting that because the court decisions were coming down that that was, uh, was not fair application of the Equal Protection Clause. And then, subsequent to that, um, same-sex marriages became legal. And that again created uh, on the university a full acceptance of that provision, whereas Virginia Baptists had a hard time accepting that in one of their institutions. And so the relationship ended on friendly terms, but there was a decision simply that it was more comfortable for the Baptist General Association to, to no longer be financially supporting the institution. And so now there's a friendly relationship. We have the Baptist Historical Society in one of the wings of the library, and that's a great benefit to the institution as well as to the, the historical society. And so it's, it's a positive and cooperative relationship. And there is a very strong sense of, of uh, commitment to service to, to Richmond both by students and by uh, the institution. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's a common shift that's occurred in a lot of Baptist institutions. But in terms of the history, in 1832, the, the, um, the Virginia Baptist Seminary was opened. In 1840, after eight, uh, eight years of of work, it closed. And at that point, the, the Baptist Seminary was transformed into Richmond College. It was transformed because it was in the same location at Grace and Lombardy, but the Baptist uh, Seminary did not have a board of trustees. It simply had a committee of the General Association that was sponsoring the Baptist Seminary. And the decision was that to go forward and be successful, there needed to be a continuation of the Baptist relationship, but now no longer as a seminary, but as a college. 
And so the college still offered courses in theology and Bible and, and uh, the classics. It was a very classical education, but was no longer um, under the direct control of the Baptists. And the relationship over the years was on and off. Sometimes money came from the association, sometimes it didn't. One of the sad stories was one of the great presidents in the history of, of Richmond uh, College that then became the University of Richmond in, in effect in 19, um, let's see, 19, I think the official name change was 1921. So the, the move to the West End to the current campus uh, was made by the Board of Trustees under the leadership of President Boatwright. And what that meant was a very different support pattern. Somehow President Boatwright and the head of the Baptist General Association were not on the same page and there was not a steady support from the General Association. There was freedom to go to the churches and raise money and there was free to go to Baptist individuals and raise money, but there was no annual allocation. After Boatwright died, or excuse me, he didn't, after he retired, George Maudlin came, and then there began an annual subsidy from the Baptist General Association that at the time he came was 10% of the budget. And w University of Richmond at that point did not go outside of Virginia in recruiting students. And that all changed after the Robbins gift. Because with the Robbins gift, the general association ties uh, were diminished. Because until that time, all of the trustees were nominated by the Baptist General Association, elected by the board, but nominated by the Baptist General Association. And, pres and um, Claiborne Robbins believed that if the University of Richmond were to have a national stature, it was better that the Baptists have less representation. And so there was a reduction in the board membership to 20% of the board. So out of the 40, eight would be chosen by the Baptist General Association. And that's, now there's no, now there is no requirement. It's because after the end of the uh, formal relationship, that's how it's gone. But, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, of, I'm of the persuasion that a very important part of a student's education is to ask big questions. And so, um, as a reflection of, of that, perhaps we, we continue to have a lot of places where the big questions can be asked and answered. We have an excellent department of philosophy. We have a very strong political science department with people who are interested in um, in classical philosophical grounding of democratic traditions. We have very fine faculty members in the leadership school who are very com committed to the study of values and leadership, ethics and leadership. Uh, we also have the law school. We have an interest in human rights. So there's a lot of, we have a strong program in the study of religion. So th there is a lot of places where through these different kinds of uh, elements, uh, the tradition, I think, lives on. Thank you. That was a wonderful history lesson. Um, we are just about out of time, so before we leave for the afternoon, I do want to tell you what's coming up. Um, I want to remind you that our next Who Knew is going to be exactly one month from today on March 16th. And during that time, Ann Archer will interview resident Pat Kawana, retired as both Vice President of Westminster Canterbury Corporation and President of the Resident Council. We will learn about Pat's childhood growing up in New Jersey, her years as a nursing student in New York, and why she considers Westminster Canterbury her second home. So we have that to look forward to, but I do wanna say a big thank you to both of you for this um, wonderful time together. We all learned so much, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more questions to come. So thanks, and everyone have a wonderful afternoon.